Hi, we are here in the fascinating city of Jerusalem and we're standing south of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem Archaeological Park. Here a full-scale excavation has taken place. It started back in 1969 and it peeled back layers of history, uncovering structures going back to the Second Temple period. And we're fortunate enough to be joined with David Gunn, who was one of the first uh, then students to come with another group of students from the World Wide Church of God, Ambassador College, to start the dig, to start this excavation. So we're privileged to have you, Mr. Gunn. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, and always a pleasure to be here. It, it really is. Uh, we, we're here for the Feast of Tabernacles, and we've just come up to this location. And for you, being back here, you know, about 50 or so years yes. after that first dig, how does it make you feel? Well, first of all, it's very encouraging, but it also reveals, this dig here reveals so much that has changed our view of the Bible, actually, and the history of the Bible. I had a small part in it. I was basically a laborer, in truth. Right. I was not an archaeologist. I was working for an archaeologist. We worked hard for 10 weeks, and we uncovered so much. This now is beautiful, whereas then it was barren a barren rock hole really, but we worked all summer and we went down and dug down and many things were revealed and it also opened up archaeology to some degree because Professor Mazar, who was the who was, overseeing it, yes, he, for Hebrew University, he was looking for staff and um, labourers and it so happened that the Chancellor of Ambassador College, Mr. Herbert Armstrong, sent down two professors, Dr. Hay and Dr. Martin, and somehow Professor Mazar heard about this. And then Mr. Armstrong offered him staff, laborers, the thing he needed most. Right, workers. Workers, <laughs> laborers. In the hot sun. In the hot sun, and it was hot. And apparently I wasn't there. Mr. Armstrong said, well, how many do you want? And Professor Mazar was stunned. He's well, 20, 30? Well, it was 60 actually. 60 of us flew down here from all over the world, the US and Canada and Britain, of course, and Australia and Germany and other stuff. And um, we worked hard, but it transformed the dig. Right. Our work transformed the speed, the speed of excavation or clar clearing. Because this was just a dusty plain. Oh, it it's horrible. nothing like what no, we have now. I mean, nothing. we've uncovered ruins that date back, you know, as I said, to the Second Temple period. What is this dig, Doug, uh, or what did the dig and this excavation mean for Jerusalem? Well, the 1967 award had just passed, of course, so the Jewish state had taken over and they suddenly had access to places like this. Mm. And um, it meant they could really get going on the history as they saw it, of Judah and Israel. Mm. So it was transformational. The war was transformational. I mean, outside my bedroom window in this Arab hotel a few miles away was a tank track right. blown off in the war. Right. Because the Israelis didn't have access no. you know, to the part that we're standing no, in. They, they, they It reunified that war, reunified Jerusalem. Yes, it so did. it opened up new excavation it did. opportunities. And the momentum built because the right. archaeologists got involved. And Dr. Mazar was a uh, I would say a Bible-believing archaeologist. Right. Some are not really. They're Bible skeptics. Yes. And uh, I mean, it, this dig was a large. It's a large area, L-shaped dig wrapped around the southwestern corner of the Temple Mount. And um, when we arrived, there were Arab workers here. Mm. And we got stuck in, and then um, yeah, Tractors. we started to clear away the ground. And it so happened, one of the students, Dr. Mazar, was very happy to discover this, was an artist. So she got out of her jeans and had nice clothes on. We were all slightly jealous that she could operate in an office. And we'd dig and she would sketch. Because mm. unlike Kathleen Kenyon's digs, where they went down in a trench, yeah. this dig was horizontal. They took the whole area off, photographed it, mapped it, and then went on down. Mm. This was a new idea at the yeah. time. Um, and so the office, there was an office building out there. And the office building, was not reduced in height. Gradually, it stood higher and higher above the ground. <laughs> you got lower and lower. We got lower and lower. <laughs> so what did it mean for Israel? It meant that the real um, 
the beginning of real archaeology in Jerusalem really started yeah. happening in this era. Yeah. There was a lot in the 19th century. Yeah, but this was the most important, really, it in was. the 20th century. Yes. So, so why did the church, the Worldwide Church of God, get involved in the dig? What do you think was the significance for the church? Well, I wasn't in charge, realised that, but uh, I was 20. But I think the Chancellor, Mr Armstrong, thought that it was time to clear away the debris that lay between debris round old Jerusalem, clearing the way ultimately for the restoration of God's kingdom. Aye, there'll be a throne here one day. Mm. Not exactly sure where. Right. Might be here, might be further down, we're not quite sure. But he felt it was the time to clear away the debris in preparation whenever that would be for the return of Christ. That's really what it was about. And the throne being that, the, throne. the temple, the, the millennial yes. temple, okay, the yes. third temple and things like that. Well, yes, exactly. Um, that's, that was where it was then. Right. I'm sure it developed, but yes. you have to start somewhere. Absolutely. Well, it, he had clearly had foresight in sending students down. And what an opportunity for yourself and for those other students. OK, we're going to have a short walk around this site. We'll. Uh, have a look into some of the various parts of the excavation. But I'm curious to drill down, Mr. Gunn, on what this dig meant for you personally, all those years ago, but also now. Well, it, it did do something, but at the beginning, of course, I was just digging and working. But something happened. I remember writing in the front of my Bible, the verse is about Jerusalem and uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Yeah. And I sort of gradually came to realize that Jerusalem, obviously the most of this stuff was not here when Christ was here, it's right. been rebuilt. Jerusalem is not just a place, it's an idea. Mm. It's an idea. I mean, hymns have been written about Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, you know, uh, famous hymns, because it's the idea of a better world, a perfect world, where children can run freely, Eden restored. Eden restored. Paradise on earth. Exactly. Okay, it's a little bit ideological, I suppose, but nevertheless, a world where people are happier and there's no crime yeah. and no suffering and so on. That's, that registered with me. Right. Somehow in my subconscious. So I would say, therefore, and answer your question, that for me, Jerusalem has become a love story. Right. Explain what you mean by that. Well, I fell in love with the idea of a perfect world a better world through God and in a way my heart got uh, pulled in by this mm. I know it sounds a little odd but I'm a, a man but I thought wait a minute this is wonderful we live in a world with many problems we all know that but the concept of a peaceful city under God's benign reign with all that goes with it children running in the streets mm. happy families no crime enough food, joy. I got that. Mm. I got that. Oh, okay. Whereas so much we are dealing with is you know, whether it be pollution or whatever else or crime, terrible right. crime, broken families. That's not going to take us anywhere good. No. This symbolizes, symbolizes a better world. Eden restored. And yes. Paradise on earth. Yes. But at a practical level, it's a city. It's not a, a garden. Yes. We have to live here. We have to rub shoulders. We have to do everything, but it's a concept. And many people have picked up on that, including socialists. Yes, yes. In hymns and so on and so forth. They understand New Jerusalem, yeah. building Jerusalem. A it's a concept. Absolutely. In fact, actually, it's, a, it's an unusual concept because we have, in a world that's fractious and it's divided down ideological fault lines and religious differences, we have the three monotheistic religion, religions, Judi Judi Judaism, Christianity and Islam, all understanding and believing in a concept that this is a holy city. That's, right. That's an incredible amount it of is. unity over a concept. And so Jerusalem, although it has a geographical small footprint, has a incredibly huge ideological, psychological footprint which is uh, on global. the masses, which, which is, is global. global. Uh, absolutely. So Jerusalem means much to many. In, in fact, OK, because I've been here a few times, it's easy for me if you hadn't been here you wouldn't understand. But I would try and make what I'm doing or where I live my Jerusalem. Right. Reflecting God's way. Mm. Imperfectly, I know. Yes. But it's a concept. And we are often driven by concepts, yes. aren't we? 
trying to create a little bit of heaven on earth, I exactly. guess. Exactly. You order your own The life, yellow brick road, yes, you might say. Yeah. But it's, I know it sounds a bit emotional, but it's not. It's real. You've got to have something yes. in your mind sometimes. We, <laughs> we, we know that Jesus Christ came here and so on and so forth. Sometimes we need something to think about to frame all this. I agree, because often Christian theology can become very ethereal. We know there that there is a heavenly Jerusalem, that there is a Zion, a strong fortress in heaven, but when you come to Jerusalem and experience the sights and the sounds and the smells and the tastes and these magnificent walls and the steps which we will talk about in a minute, it becomes tangible, this concept that we're all striving for and we're three-dimensional creatures. We are. And, and we, we certainly are helped psychologically and emotionally with engaging with the tangible. And, and also, to be frank these days or as we've discovered in the last few days people are coming here from around the world Christians mm. to respect the festival of Sukkot mm. because they believe it has some significance yes. in the great plan of God well yes. that's a pretty good thought isn't it isn't that a good thought I've met amazingly people on planes and things who think this is important yes not just for Jews but for Christians so this place pulls people together yes and places all nations will all come all nations here. yes yes that's a prophecy of the future yes yeah what is. what is that prophecy what and, and what what do your understanding of the prophecy of all, all well, nations and why as i stand here i'm looking at the mount of olives right there and um there is a prophecy that the messiah will come to this place mm. when man has exhausted himself exhausted himself and destroyed himself to restore a good world, to create a good world, and to bring the right thinking, the right thoughts, the right actions, mm. the right ideas, the right lifestyle. Mm. Mm. That's what this is all about. And man has proved, I think, fairly conclusively after thousands of years of civilization, mm. we're not doing good very no. well at this. No. We need some help. No. So and that's what we're waiting for. Exactly. And so it draws people together, but it's going to draw the Messiah, Jesus. He's prophesied Over that he's there. going to come. And his first coming was, of course, to this place and space. And so his ministry or his work in, in this modern age is going to be bookend by Jerusalem and Jerusalem. He ascended and yes. he's going to come again. But when he first came, he walked on these steps. Now, tell us a little bit about these steps, uh, because I know that your excavations uh, or your, the dig happened the other side of the wall where we would just uh, were, but also this side, and they uncovered these incredible uh, steps, steps leading up to the south of the temple. They did. Uh, Professor Mazar's granddaughter, Elat Mazar, who sadly died fairly recently, can, carried on the tradition of excavations. And down in the city of David, a lot of work she did is now bearing fruit. Just down there, just, just down here. behind us, yeah. And I, broadly speaking, they're uncovering the history of the access to, to, the, to the city, to the Temple Mount. Yes. There was a great, great, uh, what, walkway running up there for the pilgrims to go to Jerusalem. Yeah. We didn't know that a few years ago. Nobody knew this. The Pool of Siloam is where people would wash, cleanse themselves, and walk their way up. And this was part of it. Mm. This is the way for the pilgrims. They're rising up, dare I say it, to meet mm. God. Yes. In type. Of They're course. ascending to God in type. And, uh, and they had to cleanse themselves down there of their sin, let us say, and then ritualis ritualistically walk up here and uh, honor God at the temple. Mm. Mm. So in our lives, we have to cleanse ourselves, clear up our lives, mm. and walk towards God. Yes who gives us the example of how to live. Mm, absolutely. Thank you for your insights. A, a final question, a final word. If someone was going to come to Jerusalem and ha hasn't been before, why should they come? To fall in love mm. with God's purpose. Well, that's a beautiful end, Mr. Gunn. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we've had a blast here in Jerusalem. We've met with brethren for the Feast of Tabernacles and it's been a joyous time. And if you would ever like to visit, as David has just said, it's a city that you can fall in love with and a city that has great purpose for the future. Take care. Shalom for now.